much for joining us for tonight's program, A la Francoise, French Military Dress, 1780 to 1782. Our speaker, Dr. Matthew Cagle, is a former adjunct curator for the Newport Historical Society, who now serves as the curator at Fort Ticonderoga Museum. Tonight, he will highlight the intricate details of French uniforms, a topic that is of special interest to him as he studies the material culture of the early modern military with an emphasis on military dress in the long 18th century. Any further but, delay, I'd like to present Dr. Matthew Cagle. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And it's, it's good to at least virtually be back in Newport if I can't physically be there right now, um, talking about a subject that is quite near and dear to my heart. And so without anything more, I think we should jump right into that. Um, and uh, although I've, I've set the boundary for this talk as 1780 and 82, and I hope to, to illuminate what the French army uh, dressed like when they arrived here in North America during our War of Independence, uh, in many ways, this, this talk goes much beyond those dates because I think it's really important to understand the context of what Rochambeau's army brought to Rhode Island and brought to North America during the brief operational time um, that they were here on this continent, because it represents something much, much bigger um, and something that has a really profound impact on the, the military history of uh, the broader Atlantic world. And I think to start with, we have to step back and realize that by the time the French army landed in Rhode Island, what a sea change this was for people that just 20 years earlier had faced the French army on the other side of a battlefield um, that grew up in a culture, a British print culture uh, that denigrated the French army, their military capabilities, and frankly, their appearance. I mean, you can look at uh, caricatures like these that were done by Hogarth in the middle of the century where the, the French soldier is hardly someone to be feared wearing an updated, uh, very handsome uniform. Rather, they're uh, generally depicted as kind of emaciated, uh, you know, skeleton dressed in rags, hardly the picture of military discipline and proficiency. And to a certain extent, this was the military culture that uh, Anglo-Americans grew up with. In fact, they would have been and their limited encounters with the actual French military during the Seven Years' War wouldn't have given them much more to go on. In fact, uh, the Rhode Islanders of Colonel Henry Babcock's provisional or provincial regiment that served during the Seven Years' War uh, at the Battle of Carrion at Fort Ticonderoga, where I work today in 1758, really saw nothing more of real French uniforms than the hats of the French soldiers and the muzzles of their guns as they mowed down the Anglo-American army that attacked their positions. And the following year in 1759, uh, as the British army rolled over French positions across North America, the French uniform itself became an object of kind of derision uh, and shame. So for instance, during the final capture of Fort Ticonderoga by General Jeffrey Amherst in 1759, uh, a British deserter from the 17th Regiment of Foot who had deserted to the French was recaptured wearing a French uniform. And he was hung wearing that uniform. Uh, as the whole army was forced to parade by and, and look at this spectacle of someone you know, turning their coat, quite literally. Uh, and when he was cut from the gallows, he was buried with that French uniform as a mark of shame. So this is the culture that Anglo-Americans saw the French uniform within. And of course, it's one that continued into the revolutionary era, certainly in the British press, where we get satirical representations like this that you may have seen before, depicting, in this case, specifically Rochambeau's expeditionary force, again, portraying the, the French army as little kind of mincing fops rather than as a successful military force. But to understand what the actual material world that French soldiers brought to America is, we have to understand the context of how they had evolved by the time of our War of Independence. And this requires us to step back in history uh, a fair amount, back really to the late 17th century, because it's in the late 17th century that we see the development of military dress as we understand it today. Um, military uniforms, that is uniform garments worn by an entire, in most cases, national army are a distinct artifact of the early modern period, of the coalescence of nation states and of armies that fight and are paid by those states. And it's the French really that lead the development of this institution and of the garments that define that institution, despite the English claim uh, to inventing uniforms in the new model army during the British civil wars. 
And uh, we have at least one example of that that I show you here, which is from the Army Museum in Stockholm, which is an actual late 17th century French made uniform, one of four that they have, which are probably the oldest surviving true uniforms uh, in existence. And they show not only the influence of France as a stylistic arbiter, uh, as a conceptual arbiter of the concept of uniforms itself, but even for the material garments, because we know that not only is France making uniforms for themselves, they are exporting uniforms uh, like these ones in Sweden, uh, as well as to Spain, which continues to buy uniforms from France even into the early 18th century. Uh, the image from Watteau that I'm showing you here um, shows what was coalescing around the turn of the 17th into the 18th century as the identifiable French uniform made of a gris blanc cloth that is a, a gray white or really a kind of natural colored cloth with various colored cuffs and collars uh, to identify different regiments. This became the standard uniform of the French military going into the 18th century and would see it through the first half. We can look at images like these um, that are roughly 20 years apart. And although there are some stylistic changes going on, there's relatively little evolution uh, in the ultimate style of French military dress. Being leaders in the field, uh, they didn't see too much need, it seems, to innovate. And although I'm not one to discount minor variations and minor details, there is a certain continuity in the style of French military dress in the first half of the 18th century um, that's characterized by long, full skirts, deep, full cuffs, and by, frankly, a, a fairly arcane system of regimental identification based both on the color of the button, either yellow or white metal, uh, the color of the facings, and the orientation and shape of the pocket flaps of the coat and the orientation of buttons on it, itself a stylistic feature that harkens back to the fashions of the late 17th century when France developed military uniforms. So in effect, the French army that goes to war in the Seven Years' War, what we know as the French and Indian War here in North America, is wearing a uniform that in many ways is decades old. And we see that expressed in, in images like this, which I think is a striking uh, lineup printed in Germany, which depicts a number of the combatant nations of the Seven Years' War. And just to the right of center, we see the French soldier, once again, in the characteristically wide, full-skirted juste corps or habit, his coat, uh, with the deep, full cuffs, looking very French. And next to him, in the center of the image, is what's really shaking up the, the sartorial world of the military of the 18th century, which is the Prussian soldier. Uh, he's depicted here as a grenadier with a cap on, but the, the side by side comparison of the Prussian and the French soldier really shows these two different stylistic worlds the French coming from this older style, the Prussians having this what frankly to most of Europe was a curiously tight fitting uh, uniform that was being adopted in this small kingdom, uh, but ultimately becomes through the Prussian victories during the Seven Years' War, uh, a dominant military style across the continent and even across the Atlantic Ocean. And that's characterized again by these tighter fitting cuffs, tighter fitting sleeves, uh, more form fitting body, shorter skirts to the coat, um, a, a real diminution of all the proportions uh, of the particular uniform. And I don't think this should be a spoiler to anyone, but the French don't come out of the Seven Years' War very well. Uh, in fact, it's a catastrophe for the French state. Um, from India to North America to Europe itself, the French find themselves humbled across the globe, and it causes an incredible amount of reflection uh, on the part of French military authorities and thinkers. What could have happened that the greatest power in Europe was so thoroughly humbled? And it causes a lot of soul searching as the French administration and the military really look at kind of every aspect of their military apparatus and start to think about reforming them, to bring them back uh, up to the standard that France is known for. And this draws on a host of, of different principles coming out of the broader enlightenment, uh, coming out of French theorists, coming out of military practice. Uh, and it, it 
initiates a, a dramatic change in the French army over the 1760s and 70s, which is ultimately what comes to America in some form in the early 1780s. And one of the key figures in this in many ways is Marshal Saxe, Maurice de Saxe, the um, German-born French uh, marshal who served in the War of the Austrian Succession, who brought the Ancien Regime some of its greatest victories of the entire century. And in his posthumously published Reveries or Memoirs on the Art of War, um, he provides a kind of rambling theoretical account of, of how things should be changed to make warfare more effective, more efficient. Uh, and he spends a great deal of time talking about soldiers' clothing, uh, really addressing all of the deficiencies that he and other officers had seen in French soldiers' dress, coming in some ways out of that French style uh, that was the dominant factor of the, the late 17th and early 18th centuries, that the French soldier was burdened by too much cloth, by clothing that didn't help him move, that didn't keep him comfortable, that didn't keep him healthy, which is also part of a strain of thinking that increasingly uh, paid attention to the health and the well-being of soldiers is one of the things that really constituted an effective army. And so although Sachs was dead by the time the Seven Years' War was going on, um, his writing was very influential and many of his subordinate officers were still serving uh, and spreading that. And there's also a new generation of military thinkers that's adding to this literature, building off of Sachs and off of their own practical experiences to look at how the French army can do better. And so the French reforms that really uh, come about in the 1760s, even before the, the war is over in some cases, um, represent a dramatic change uh, in the French military condition. Um, everything from literally the design and building of warships down to the buttons on soldiers' uniforms. Everything is open for alteration and it happens. Uh, this begins, as I said, as early as the, the end of the Seven Years' War itself. In 1762, there's a new uniform regulation that's promulgated, which, for instance, is the first one, um, at least from my research in all of Europe, to introduce marked military buttons to the uniforms of soldiers' uniforms or soldiers' attire, which is uh, a really dramatic change and, and, frankly, something we still live with to this day, where dress uniforms, military buttons um, still bear, if not regimental insignia, the national insignia. Uh, and this pair of portraits right here, both from the Musée de l'Armée in Paris, uh, show an interesting uh, evolution of this as we see in the portrait on the right, what is the beginning of the changes of these uniforms, continuing some of the kind of archaic French stylistic details like regimental distinctions, but on a, on a piece of clothing that's gradually clinging closer and closer to the body than the fuller garments that defined the first part of the century. And this picks up pace dramatically as we get into the later 1760s and 70s. Um, by 1767, a new uniform is authorized um, that continues the very long skirts of French uniforms that the French army is known for, but again, reduces almost all the other features of the uniforms, um, dramatically reducing the bulk and the amount of material that is used for them, uh, doing away finally with that big, deep kind of boot cuff that the French army had been known for and adopting this slash cuff that becomes a dominant feature of French uniforms for the rest of the century. Uh, in the early 1770s, they adopt what you see here, which is a, a cask or a cap um, that represents a couple of different strains, one of them being neoclassicalism, uh, frankly. The adoption of these kind of classical style helmets is popular uh, across Europe. You can think about the British Light Infantry, I think, is uh, expressing a similar concept, but it also comes out of the theoretical issues that military thinkers are dealing with and their dislike of the felt hats that are worn by soldiers across Europe as not being uh, effective in, in providing men with, with um, protection and also being able to, to absorb too much water and keep that moisture close to the head, affecting the health of soldiers. Again, part of that issue of going back to the, the health and well-being of these men. Um, and so we see the French army adopt this, this cask in the early 1770s, although it ultimately doesn't last long because they find it to be rather um, cumbersome and, and frankly, fairly expensive compared to the cost of, uh, of hats. This is also followed subsequently by yet another new comprehensive military regulation in 1775. So for those of you keeping track at home, we've got a new regulation in 1762, 1767, 1775, and then an even more dramatic change in 1776. In 1776, we see the appointment of the Comte Saint-Germain as the Minister of War for France. 
uh, who himself is, is kind of a microcosm of the international world of soldiering in the 18th century. He was a, a French uh, Frenchman uh, of low noble birth, so he really wasn't able to get any high ranking commands in the French army, and he goes abroad for his military experience to the Palatinate, to the Austrian Empire, um, eventually seeing service with the French armies during the War of the Austrian Succession when men are needed, uh, and he serves under Marshal Saxe, gaining experience under this influential officer. He continues to serve as a French uh, commander during the Seven Years' War um, until he ultimately resigned because of disputes with his superiors. And he winds up as the war minister and effectively the commander in chief of the army of the Kingdom of Denmark in the early 1760s, where he's responsible for revamping the whole Danish army as that kingdom uh, fears an invasion by the Russians. And he implements a whole host of changes there before ultimately uh, falling out of favor and, and kind of going into semi-retirement. And in 1776, he's kind of a dark horse candidate for war minister in France, but he arrives in this position and he goes about instituting a slew of reforms that are intended to streamline, modernize, and professionalize the French army. And among the most interesting, and I think the most material of these, is an alteration to the uniforms of the French army. Uh, the regulation that he issues fairly early in his tenure in 1776, which has nothing to do with our war of independence at all, introduces a dramatically new cut and style uh, to the uniform of the French army, doing away with that long skirted abbey that is so characteristic uh, of the French army and adopting what is called an abbey vest, or in English, probably the best translation is a jacket. So the abbey vest would be buttoned along its full length, again, to keep the soldier warm and comfortable. Uh, under his jacket was no longer the old vest, but a belted waistcoat uh, with a tight belt that could be adjusted to adjust the tension on the soldier's abdomen. There were redesigned gaiters to allow the soldiers' gaiters to be held up more easily and to do away with the various straps um, and garters that constricted the flow of blood around the soldiers' knees that reformers complained about. What's more, the uniform contained uh, a fascinating uh, couple of garments that were completely distinct, one of them being the hat. Although they continued to wear a hat rather than a cap of some type, as many reformers um, encouraged, this cap was totally different. And if any of you are familiar with the anachronistic term tricorn hat, this goes a step further and introduced a quadricorn cap. It is literally a hat with four, four sides, as it's described, with a complex series uh, of cords that allowed the soldier to adjust the tension and the angle of the leaves to drain water off the head uh, in rain. Again, going back to that issue of, of letting the soldier be healthy. And on top of that all, um, and the image to the, to the right here shows a depiction, one of the very few known depictions um, of the Reading goat, uh, or kind of a corruption of the English riding coat that was introduced for the French army, which was effectively an overcoat. And this represents among the very first, if not the first time in European military history that every soldier was to be provided with an outer garment. Um, that he could wear in winter or in rain to keep him warm and healthy. And again, this goes back to Saxe's writings. This goes back to Saint-Germain's own theoretical writings about keeping soldiers healthy and allowing them to operate better in the field. So this is perhaps, I, I think, the most practical military regulation of the entire 18th century. And yet the response to it in France was mixed, to say the least. Um, we know that not all of these uh, elements were, were implemented. Um, we know part of that is because of the pace of the resupply of French clothing. French military uniforms were replied or were resupplied on a three year cycle, not for the whole regiment, but for a third of the regiment. So it could take three years for a new regulation to be implemented. And given the pace of all these previous regulations, 1762, 1767, 1775, 1776, there's a backlog of these that were coming into effect. Um, and it was also frankly disliked um, by many. Many felt that it was too much of a departure despite the fact that the uniforms remained the bourbon white of the French army from the traditional cut uh, of French uniforms. Uh, and so one of the few pieces of evidence we have um, of this is this surviving garment from the Poitou Regiment at the Musée de l'Armée, which is actually made in the distinctive colors 
that were uh, implemented in 1776. But the cut is that of the previous regulation of 1775. So clearly they have not adopted the radical design of this uniform. Rather, um, they've simply taken the superficial features and added them to a more characteristically French uniform. Now, I included a, an image from a series of uniform plates here to show uh, what this looks like in practice, but I, I want to make one brief aside about uniform plates and uniform schema as documents as we understand what armies in the 18th century looked like, because uniform schema are um, an imperfect source at best. Uh, and I, I really came to that conclusion more greatly looking at a lot of these very closely and, and realizing that the pace of military reform, especially by the 1760s and 70s, uh, and the fact that many of these were, were colored on engraved plates meant that engravers and printers were often well behind the curve of what was being implemented. Uh, and that meant that they would simply color in the designs, you know, like a child with a coloring book to reflect what the new regulations were supposed to be, rather than design new plates uh, to be what they, they actually were. And I think you get a great sense of that uh, looking at the enlarged image here, which is um, a soldier of the Guadeloupe Regiment, one of the colonial regiments um, of the French military. And it was a totally new uniform that was implemented in the early 1770s. There were no plates for it. And if you look very carefully, you can see that they just colored over the buttons that existed on one of the other plates to get the effect of what this new uniform was supposed to be. So at best, uniform plates, uniform schema like this are representation of the ideals of military dress rather than their actual practice. However, uh, despite the kind of piecemeal implementation of the 1776 uniform, uh, Saint-Germain's ministry was, was destined to collapse as it did by 1778. Within that period of time though, that relatively small period of time, the Comte Saint-Germain had been able to impl implement an incredible range of reforms to the army, from the uniforms um, to the, the payment of troops, to cutting down the, the household troops of the, the French king, which were expensive and, and not very effective, um, also implementing new punishments, new military drill, many of which were disliked. Uh, and many of these were disliked, not because they were necessarily ineffective, many of them were quite effective and practical, but because they were seen as being un-French. Uh, Prussian is a term that's applied to a lot of these. Now, many of these things are, are hardly Prussian at all, but they represented something that many felt was incompatible with the French character. And so with Saint-Germain's fall, uh, we see a reversion somewhat to previous models that are uh, described as being more French. And this culminates in January of 1779 when the Prince de Montbarré, the new Minister of War, issues a comprehensive new regulation. And it is this regulation that defines uh, the French army that comes to America during our War of Independence. And what it is, is really in many ways a fascinating compromise of many of the practical elements of the theoretical conversations that were going on in the 1760s and 70s uh, with the return of characteristically French elements, not the least of which was the coat, the habit, which is described in the text as an habit à la Françoise, a French coat. And the newspapers, the Mercure de France, uh, proclaims uh, when the new uniform is promulgated that this will return the army to a coat of the national cut. This is a French uniform. But it goes beyond that. And one of the things that they implement is a really kind of rational system. Uh, this is a detail from the actual regulation itself, which um, lays out the structure of regimental identification, which is done through an incredibly complex system of division of divisions of the army into groups of six regiments. And those six regiments are further subdivided into classes of three regiments. And depending on what division and class you were in, this determined the facing color, the button color, what parts of your uniform would receive the facing color? Would it be the, the lapels and the cuffs or would it be just the cuffs or just the lapels? Which allowed anyone looking at a, at a single uniform to be able to immediately identify what regiment they were from. It's, it is rational to the point of being pedantic. 
um, but represents the culmination in some ways of the military material enlightenment of this period. And this guides the French army um, that comes to America, particularly the metropolitan regiments under Rochambeau's command of Bourbonnois, Soissonnois, and Saint-Ange, um, all of which bore distinctions on their uniforms, uh, which correspond uh, to, to this regulation and to the, the systematic division of these uniforms. Um, there's nothing special necessarily about these three regiments uh, as, as so far as their um, kind of characteristics of uniform or that they had any particularly interesting uh, or unique styles to them. Uh, they were part of the army that had been massing in northern France in anticipation for an invasion uh, of uh, Great Britain. Uh, they were up to strength, which was needed for regiments that would be away from home for a long time. But they represent a number of those different divisions of uniform styles that were borne by the French army. Um, if we look at some of the extant artwork from the period, we get a better sense of what the, the cut of the 1779 uniform was. And you can see, especially in the image to the right of this uh, grenadier from the Condé Regiment in Strasbourg, uh, that again, we, we are back to the characteristically long skirted French uniform. So if nothing else of French military style from the first half of the 18th century survives, it's the long skirts, which become identifiably French. Um, the, the cut of his uniform, um, even just looking at the, the horizontal pocket flap and the color of his buttons would allow us to identify within a regiment or two uh, that particular regiment without seeing any of the rest of the uniform. Uh, the image of Jean Tourel, who was a kind of the, the universal soldier of the 18th century, born in the 17th century, died in the 19th century, um, was a member of the Touraine Regiment, which actually did serve in America during the War of Independence, uh, although they came up from the West Indies rather than across the Atlantic with Rochambeau, uh, is probably the best depiction of what the 1779 uniform looks like. And you can see that it's got a fairly uh, long body. It has a, a relatively plain waistcoat underneath with the regimental buttons. In this case, uh, the Touraine Regiment had the distinction of being in the second class, that is the buttons were of white metal, which means that he has vertical pocket flaps, even though we can barely see them. Um, and the fact that he has only the solid colored cuffs and the lapels are outlined in the face and color uh, represents again that characteristic uh, rational system of identification that the French army carried with them uh, when they came to America. You might also notice that the sleeves are, are fairly bulky for the time period. If any of you are familiar with kind of 1770s dress, we're talking about an era which has fairly slim fitting sleeves. These are a little fuller because the French soldier wore underneath that a sleeved vest. Uh, this is another characteristic feature of French clothing that goes back to the beginning of the 18th century, a sleeved vest worn under a, a fuller coat. So the coat could be saved for parades, for guard mount, for formal duties, and the soldier could work in effectively a small jacket. Um, we see images of, of metropolitan troops uh, at the bottom here in Blarenberg's image from Yorktown wearing such sleeves vests, uh, as well as artillerymen on Martinique uh, wearing their version uh, of this sleeved vest. So despite the, the trend towards those kind of Prussian slim fitting styles, the French army maintains the use of this sleeved vest well into the end of the 18th century. And finally, in some ways, you know, we, we top off the whole uniform with a hat and we're back here to a traditional, more traditional at least, cocked hat. Um, the French army is somewhat unique in this uh, form for adopting a hat that isn't trimmed at this point for most of the army with uh, a contrasting lace uh, around the edges like they wore earlier. It is a uniformly black trim to the hat, creating a really distinctive look to the French army at this time period. And the hat is now, at least by regulation, universal for the army. Whether you're talking about the fusiliers who are effectively the French equivalent of the battalion companies of the British army, the grenadiers, or the, the new chasseurs, the light infantry troops of the French army, all of them are supposed to wear a hat. Um, now, we know in practice, this isn't always the case. There are exceptions to every rule. Uh, the image I showed you earlier of the Condé Regiment clearly showed a grenadier wearing the tall bearskin cap, which is officially abolished for the French army. Furthermore, we have evidence that the Soissonnat Regiment, um, which is with Rochambeau, had their bearskin grenadier caps and wore them in America because they attracted attention as the regiment marched through Philadelphia. So clearly the intention of the French state to implement these uh, changes to uniforms uh, found exceptions uh, in the dress of various regiments. 
And in fact, there were some exceptions that were built into the system. And this gets to the heart of the kind of the fascinating world of the early modern military, which is early and modern. It is right at the cusp of modernity. We do not have an institution yet where things can be implemented from above and are precisely and exactly followed. There are still varying levels of authority that vie with each other. And some of that is actually built into the structure of the French military. So within that, that rational system for identification, there are exceptions like the royal or princely regiments. Um, there's an image from the Museum of the American Revolution of, the, of an officer of the Monsieur Regiment who has a really distinctive uh, kind of collar tab that is totally unique uh, in the artwork from that period. Or the, the detail of this garment, which is slightly later from the uh, Colonel General Regiment, which continues to use this set of paired pocket flaps with these duck footed button arrangements that actually dates back at least to the early 18th century and probably to the 17th century, which it adopted from the Picardy Regiment, which it was created from in the early 1780s. So we see the persistence of royal and noble privileges and even regimental details, despite the fact that the war ministry is trying to implement a much more standardized military dress. And this goes broader into the structure of the French army, because of course, there's a significant minority of the French military that are what they call foreign corps, that are not Frenchmen, they are foreigners, the, the largest of which are the Swiss regiments of the French army who distinctively wear red uniforms, whether it's the Swiss guards of the household troops uh, or the various marching regiments uh, of Swiss soldiers recruited in the Swiss cantons, uh, but fighting in the service of France. In addition to that, there are a number of Irish regiments which again, wear red uniforms, um, which was something that they adopted going back to um, coming into the French army in the late 17th century from service in the British Isles. And these persist through the end of the 18th century. And then there are the German regiments uh, of the French army and the German regiments wear a distinctive blue uniform, um, what is specifically described as blue celeste français, so a dark sky blue, not a, a bright pale blue, but a, a kind of a medium colored blue identifiable for these German regiments, which includes um, as the garment here on the left shows the Royal Swedish Regiment um, of the French army. And I bring up this difference because we see some of that in America as well in the form of the Regiment Royal de Dupont, which is a German regiment, which was explicitly sent to America because part of Rochambeau's corps, I believe a third, was determined by, by military authorities to be composed of Germanic troops in the French service. Uh, I think there was some hope that they would recruit amongst the German auxiliaries fighting with the British. Um, adding to their manpower in America. In practice, this didn't really happen, um, but it was optimistic at least. But we see this regiment of ethnic Germans in America whose uniform in its cut and overall style matches that of those other metropolitan regiments, um, but is in this distinctive blue identifying uh, one of these uh, foreign corps within the British army, or rather within the French army. And we also see that in one more unit and the, the two other main uh, corps that we see coming with Rochambeau um, are a detachment of the, the Royal Artillery, the Corps Royal d'Artillerie um, and uh, elements of the Legion of Luzon, which was originally raised for the Marine Department. Not the entire regiment came to America, only their Hussars, their mounted troops, uh, their Chasseurs and Grenadiers did. Uh, and like the Dupont Regiment as a foreign corps, very explicitly, they wore a similar uniform in that blue color that was identifiable for Germans. Their Hussars wore a totally different uniform, unlike anything else seen in America, which really, I think, probably caused a sensation in this country um, because it, it represented so much of, of continental European design. And this image here, although it is, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, somewhat dubious uniform plate, is the only contemporary representation um, of those czars that came to America. Um, the cap or the merleton um, that is above is uh, one of the only surviving objects from this regiment, but it's from a later iteration of this regiment. But I, I bring it up just to show you also the very distinctive headgear that they would have worn deeply in contrast with the cocked hats worn by the rank and file of the rest of the infantry or the artillery. And as you can see, the artillery wore a uniform that was, again, effectively in a similar cut to that worn by the infantry, but in the royal blue color that was distinctive uh, to the Corps of Artillery and was fairly consistent among artillerymen across Europe um, of many nations.
Now, I just want to step back for a moment here and address the officers of the French army because they're an important uh, aspect of the French uh, military system. And the French throughout the 18th century had tried to rein in the officer corps which liked to dress very nicely and often dress very non-regimentally. And so regulation after regulation sees the king through the ministers of war trying to police what the French officer corps can wear, saying you can't wear embroidery, you can't wear silk, you know, doing away with all this stuff to show that they serve the king, not necessarily themselves. And this continues into these regulations in the 1770s. And by the time you get to the 1779 regulation, uh, it is very clear that the officers of the French army are supposed to wear uniforms that match exactly that of their men. The, the only distinction really being in the quality of the materials, finer grades of wool, uh, silver instead of you know, pewter or other base metals for the buttons or gold instead of brass, um, and that these would identify them as well as the epaulets on their shoulders, which followed a, a complex system of identification for different ranks, uh, as well as uh, gorgets or an oscol uh, on service worn just below the neck and their swords, of course, uh, that they would carry by their sides. But otherwise, they were supposed to dress just like the men. But again, in practice, there are always exceptions. And this shows us the permeability uh, and the kind of negotiated quality of the, the material experience of the 18th century. Because although we have examples of portraiture, of surviving garments that by and large uh, express this, uh, this interest in having French officers maintain the uniforms um, of the rank and file, like those you see here, which pretty closely follow their various regiments, we also find examples like this which is a, an artillery officer's uniform at the Musée de l'Armée, which is entirely made of silk, which is expressly forbidden in all the regulations of the time period. Maybe this was allowed because the officer was serving in the West Indies or the East Indies, but nevertheless, it goes totally against uh, the regulations in effect, or even little details like the wonderful portrait of this couple here, uh, where the officer appears in black breeches instead of white. And we know from some uh, surviving regulations at the regimental level that some regiments allowed their officers to wear things like black breeches um, in the winter. And so when we find visual evidence of this, it's one more kind of piece of the puzzle showing the kind of negotiated quality of, again, in this material experience um, of the French army at this time period. So the uniforms that the French military under Rochambeau's command brought to Rhode Island in the summer of 1780 were not just different because they were French, they were different because they represented a dramatic change in military theory and practice. They represent the material expression in many ways of the military enlightenment that was a world apart from what Anglo-Americans had seen and faced during the French and Indian War, uh, and even what their uh, allies and enemies um, here in North America were facing. For instance, the British Army, which was nowhere near as kind of theoretically or practically as advanced um, as the British or the French military of this time period. And so it represents really something dramatic and something that had a long lasting effect in the French military in the broader uh, world of the, the late 18th century. Um, this plate is from the regulations of 1786, which obviously are dated after the, the Revolutionary War, but really kind of go further in codifying and making explicit many of the details of that previous regulation of 1779, that is building and expanding upon it down to including a print like this, which literally has the dimensions for pocket flaps and lapels and shoulder straps and turn back ornaments so that there can be no deviation from the regulations. Again, at least in theory, but it shows the increasing interest of the state in exerting their control and power over the material world um, of their soldiers, which follows with efforts um, of, of states more broadly to, to in, implement themselves into the lives uh, of their subjects and later their citizens. And I think it's here that we see the lasting impact of the French uniform of 1779 that Rochambeau's corps brings to America, which is a, a material environment that persists from this period. And so I've laid out a few images from the collections of the Musée de l'Aumé, beginning with that regulation of 1786 on the left, which is a, a captain of grenadiers uniform, uh, going up through the 1770s, uh, sorry, 1780s, 1790s, and into the early 1800s. And I think when you put these side by side, despite the change in color that occurs during the revolution, the way these garments are made, the way materials are handled, the overall styling of them is largely consistent with that implemented in 1779. 
which shows you how advanced, how forward thinking that regulation was for the French military, because it sees the French army into the Napoleonic era. And in many cases, again, some of the handling of, of fabric, uh, details of buttons and equipment, which I, I also haven't really addressed here, um, persist well into the 19th century, even past the Napoleonic era. So the reforms that the French army implemented leading up to the American War of Independence had a profound impact on the material world of warfare for the long 18th century as a whole. And Americans experienced not that caricaturish, you know, skeletal French soldier in a tattered, uh, full skirted uniform, but really the foremost military machine of its era uh, that landed in Newport in the summer of 1780 and that would lead them to victory at Yorktown in 1781. And so it is with that sentiment uh, that I will leave the formal part of this talk uh, and see if any of you have any questions. Uh, curious about the sourcing of materials and the organization for manufacturing uniforms. This is uh, posed by David Harris. Yeah, so that's that's an aspect of um, you know French military pro kind of procurement and supply that that I think needs a lot of work. Um, we, we know that they're being made, you know, these aren't being made in a national manufactory. There are, there are some European powers where cloth uh, and even uniforms are being made at the, at the state level. And that's not the case in France. Um, they're being made typically at the regimental level. Um, like most armies from this time period, there are tailors um, within regiments who are identified. There's a master tailor within each regiment and then um, uh, workers uh, who are tailors at, at various levels within the companies who can uh, repair and make things as needed but generally they're contracted out at, at the regimental level, which I think is one of the reasons that you see some of these variations um, and these kind of persistent uh, details from earlier uniforms because they're not being made at this national level. Um, as far as the materials go, the, you know, the French have a massive textile industry, um, one that has markets across the world, literally. Uh, but there is a special part of that market that is for uh, military cloth. And in fact, the French state developed early in the 18th century um, royal privileges basically for certain areas of the country to manufacture cloth for the military that were staples of the economies of those regions. And in particular, I'm thinking about areas like the Languedoc in the south of France, which is a wool manufacturing region, um, actually often importing raw wool from Spain and then uh, weaving that into uh, to cloth that's being used. And they had, in, in some cases, in earlier regulations of the 18th century, they specified literally down to the city in some cases where the cloth for uniforms was to come from. Um, but this was often done through, again, royal privileges um, for particular manufacturing regions or areas. The, the same is true of, of arms production and other aspects of production. So the French state didn't run these, in, um, these industries, but they heavily supported them in a more overt way than say the British military, where uh, there's a little more kind of open market uh, competition for um, for goods. Um, and th the quality of French cloth, um, you know, it's interesting looking at, at French garments, the surviving garments such as they are, against surviving, say, British and German and American garments. Um, French uniform woolens never seem to have the, the fineness and the quality of English woolens um, for soldiers' clothing. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I think that one of the interesting details about the actual garments in looking at them is French uniforms kind of habitually turn the edges, even of their heaviest wools. Whereas on English garments, you expect to see that broadcloth just cut raw and left. And it's what you see on British army uniforms. The French don't do that. They turn those edges continually. And I think it's a factor of the quality of the cloth as well as the, um, the longevity of the uniforms, the expected longevity, which as I mentioned was supposed to be three years. So that, that coat has to last a while. Um, and the, the materials are subsequently somewhat coarser and thicker, but the manufacture is, is just more robust than what I see on, on English and American clothing from the period. We actually have a number of questions. Um, Joyce asks, tailor extraordinaire Henry Cook, who um, many of us know through uh, Living History Circles, he's an 18th mm -hmm. century tailor. Uh, he includes plain turret buttons with his French contract lottery coats. Is that style button characteristic of French uniforms? It absolutely is. That's one of the great details that Henry puts together with his uh, with his products. There is that um, the French 
implement a, a, a unique uh, button pattern, which is one that has, uh, and it varies a little bit depending on the example, uh, what's described as a turret or a birdcage shank, um, which is basically a kind of a solid back to the button with holes or openings at right angles. So it's, it's sewn through. Um, and that's an evolution. And that's something that really comes into effect, I think, again, during this period of reform in the 1760s, where you see buttons made like that, because previously French military buttons have, you know, just a single eye shank on them, like a lot of other buttons do. And French military regulations going back to the 1740s explicitly say that those buttons are to be corded on the uniform. Well, you can't cord a button on that has these right angle shanks behind them. Um, and so the surviving examples, we see that they are, they are sewn through the cloth like that. And for uniforms that were being contracted for the Continental Army in France, they manufactured those buttons in the same way. And I know that uh, those buttons that, uh, that Henry has made for those are based on archeological examples found here in North America. Uh, so Dan O'Sullivan, who is a member of the American Friends of Lafayette, has a uh, question. Sounds like it's going to be best answered via email because it requires looking at a particular image of a tavern sign from the Connecticut Historical Society's collection. So yes, um, Jan, we will um, get you connected. Uh, Richard asks, um, as is understood, musicians wore blue coats based on one of the Royal Regiment, blue regardless of which regiment they were in. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, so the... the um... The distinctions of, of drummers and fifers, fifers being only a, a relatively late addition to the French army by this time period, um, are consistently in uh, the royal blue with the king's livery. However, this is one of those areas too where you do see some exceptions. And I think that the, the army was, again, trying to, to consolidate and regulate and uniform, um, make more uniform the dress of, of drummers, uh, but some Royal and princely regiments, I, certainly through the 1760s, maintained privileges to wear distinctive uh, uniforms. So, for instance, the um, Regiment de la Reine, the, the Regiment of the Queen, maintained the distinction of wearing the Queen's livery instead of the King's livery. Um, and some uh, princely regiments wore the, the liveries of those princes rather than, than the King. Uh, and, and it goes back to, again, the kind of the 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 negotiated quality of the French army, but by and large, if it's not otherwise stated, uh, drummers would be wearing blue coats with the facings of their regiment uh, with the king's livery. Uh, so Rory says, thanks for the incredible. Uh, you've provided examples of which regiments go off the book from regulations, and they've been fascinating to see. Commonalities ignore the uh, One example might be the use of bearskin posts uh, 1779, of course, the regulations abolished them, but there are specific examples of regiments still wearing them. Was this widespread, or is this something which uh, isn't really provable at this point in time? Yeah, um, I, I think that it, it's those are details that we have to explore on a regimental level based on the surviving material, visual, and written culture. Um, so, it, you know, it's hard to say anything at a broad level. The, the, the example that Baron von Clausen, who's a, a German officer in the Dupont Regiment, writes about uh, Soissonois wearing their bearskin grenadier caps in Philadelphia is one of these great little tidbits of information that we have that shows that they were doing kind of something unique uh, or maintaining a regimental practice. Uh, we also know from, um, I think it's the Journal of Abbe Robin in America, that the Colonel of Soissonois also purchased linen breeches for his men to wear in the summer. And he attributes the fact that they had the least stragglers of all of Rochambeau's army as they marched south because of the fact that they had linen breeches, unlike the rest of the army. Um, so there are some of these things, again, we have to kind of explore at regimental levels. Um, the, the records in some cases for the inspection returns of the French army uh, exist uh, in Paris and, um, and, and other uh, collections in France and elsewhere. Uh, and I, I think that a, a deeper exploration of those would reveal in some cases some of the variability, which would allow us to gauge maybe more systematically, you know, how much regulations were being enforced. Uh, Justin asks, how frequently would the regimental or abbey be used during service given the primary coat was a la veste or sleeved waistcoat? I've also heard of a CHIT or coat check system when in garrison to preserve the coat. Was things like that done to help preserve the garment? Yeah, um, again, there are some, you know, regimental level orders that go into when you're supposed to wear your, your uniform. Your full uniform is obviously supposed to be worn on the most formal occasions, um, such as on parade and on guard duty. But uh, obviously, if you're, you know, 
if you're marching, you have to carry all your stuff with you and there's typically not room to store your coat. So you'd have to wear that as well. But um, we know, for instance, that one of the, the tactics that the French army used when they were in America um, was beginning their marches incredibly early in the morning. I think they, they you know, roused the men at three or 4 a.m. and got on the road and basically stopped marching by the middle of the day because they found it to be so oppressively hot in this country um, during the heat of the day. Uh, and certainly when you think about that, that uniform that they're wearing, it's pretty substantial. Um, and so uh, it, it behooves you to, to move when you have to wear the full uniform uh, in the cooler parts of the day. Um, but again, uh, going back to some of the regimental orders, we can get some sense of uh, you know, when certain garments are being worn and when they're not being worn. Um, but the French army, like most armies from the time period, is very explicit in their orders about basically telling you not to do anything that's going to damage your coat. When you're wearing your coat, so don't carry your firewood in your coat. You know, don't uh, you know do dirty tasks wearing your coat, um, and also don't necessarily try to whiten the garment to hide any stains unless you're being authorized to. Because there's a lot of discussion about how using the wrong kind of um, clays and kind of whitening agents can actually deteriorate the cloth at this time period, and so they discourage soldiers from doing that um, unless they're explicitly instructed to on many occasions. Jean Charles has a question about the front opening of the coats in the 1760s and 70s. Were the front edges of the coat cut perfectly straight and parallel or were they slightly curved in the pattern drafting process? Because on all the plates and even mannequins with eggs and garments, the opening is always curved. And we know during the Napoleonic era, the front edges were cut curved. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and it's one that, you know, over the course of the 1760s into the 1780s, um, changes somewhat um, because we know, for instance, that uh, in the regulations of the early 1770s, um, it was expected that you could you know, hook or button the lapels of the coat down, but the last three buttons below the waist in many regulations were explicitly stated to not be functional. Um, they were never intended to be closed, um, which when the coat is open gives you a, a, that kind of cutaway front. The exception to this is the 1776 uniform, which was intended to be buttoned fully down uh, the body. And actually because of that, the pockets of that uniform were to be made in the outside of the coat so that when it's all buttoned up, you can still get in your pockets because prior to that point and after that point, um, all the coat's pockets were inside the skirts so that you could get to them. Um, again, the surviving uh, examples are, are not perfect. Um, because you know we, we don't have as many as, as we would like, but uh, I'd have to look back carefully at, at some of my notes on the originals that I've examined, but typically that front does have a curvature to it. It's not, it's certainly not on the straight of grain. Um, so it, it is curving away to achieve that effect. And again, explicitly in some of the later regulations, they make very clear um, that th those were never meant to be able to button fully over. And on most surviving examples, the buttons are sewn right through the lapels so that those lapels could never be turned over to begin with, even if nominally they should be. Uh, that's our last question. So thank you very much for uh sharing all your wealth of information with us tonight and we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Elizabeth and thank you to everyone in, in Newport um, and uh, and for all of you uh, joining us this evening and I hope to see you out there someday. And we hope to host you again in Newport. Thank you everyone. Bonne nuit. Bonne nuit.